All right. Uh, good afternoon or morning or evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, hi, I am Margo Conahan. I'm ACRL's Manager of Professional Development. Thanks for joining us for today's ACRL Presents webinar, Libraries and Learning Analytics, The Future is Now. Um, just a few quick housekeeping notes before we get started. Closed captioning is available. If you just click on that live transcript button at the bottom of the screen, you can enable captions. You can use chat to comment and ask questions during the session today. And as you just heard, the session is being recorded. We will share the link to the recording shortly after the webinar. It will also be posted on the ACRL YouTube channel. Our presenters today are Be Becky Croxton, Head of Strategic Analytics and Special Projects at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Megan Oakleaf, Professor and Program Director at the Syracuse University iSchool and Ken Varnum, Senior Program Manager and Discovery Strategist at the University of Michigan. Megan, I believe you're up first, so please take it away whenever you're ready. I am up first. Thank you, Margo. It's great to be in, a, in the same space with you virtually or someday physically. Um, so welcome to all of you, and thank you for being with us for our session, Libraries and Learning Analytics, The Future is Now, as Marco said. We're excited to have you with us in what we hope will be an engaging and useful next 90 minutes. We have a lot to cover, so let's jump right in. I'm one of the co-presenters for this session, along with my colleagues, Ken and Becky. We'll be partnering through this, throughout the session to convey content and guide your active engagement. Slide, please. Thank you. I think it's important to recognize that we're embarking on a workshop today that touches upon sensitive topics in our field right now. There's some disagreement in our profession about the ways we should or shouldn't engage in this work, as well as how to avoid possible negative impact of this work on students or, or vulnerable populations. We acknowledge the necessity of being aware of these concerns and want to be open to listening to all points of view on this topic so that it may result in best practices and productive directions for the work being done in libraries. And so to that end, we want to share with you some ground rules for our time together. All of the ground rules are important, but I'll call special attention to the last two. In our time together, let's both, both trust that people are doing their best um, and take care to challenge ideas and not individuals. Slide. Thanks. We also want to recognize the assistance of IMLS in this work. Two grants in particular, Learning in Library Integration and Institutional Learning Analytics, or LILA, and Connecting Libraries and Learning Analytics for Student Success, or CLASS, have informed our thinking, and we want to thank IMLS for their support in these projects. We'll include links to the materials for these grants in chat. Actually, Ken already did. Way to be on it. We do have, as I said, limited time today, today together, so I want to thank all of you who responded to our pre-assessment for this session and made time to watch the foundational content to prepare. I also recognize that times are still very intense and that it may be that some of you plan to go back and pick up this content later, and we encourage you to do so. In any case, today's session is foregrounded by a session we presented about a year ago for ACRL. In that session, we covered definitions and current models for learning analytics, the purposes of engaging in learning analytics, and ways that librarians can make unique contributions to learning analytics on our campuses. We also provided participants with guided activities focused on research questions that may benefit from learning analytics, user stories that can guide learning analytics efforts, and possible data sources that might be included in such projects. In that early webinar, attendees engaged with content we provided to teach these concepts in a general way. Today, we're excited to have a format that will allow each of you to apply these ideas and concepts to your own goals, needs, and organizational cultures. Next, oh, you're already on it, thank you. Today, our session is less about the general content we shared in the previous webinar, and instead is focused on you and your library and institution. Our goal is to facilitate a series of activities with the overall intent of enabling you to think through possibilities that apply to your practice, both individually and with your peers. We really want you to apply what you're learning within your own context. To that end, we've designed a session that will include moving in and out of breakout sessions to provide you the time and space necessary for engaging with what you're learning today and connecting it to your local context. After a short introduction to learning analytics, very short. 
We'll move on to a breakout that will facilitate your thinking about major issues or concerns that are affecting your institution at a macro level and ways in which libraries and librarians might help address those concerns. By identifying these problems explicitly, this breakout will help you identify questions that learning analytics might help address or inform a path toward change and improvement. The second breakout will help you transform the questions you identify in the first breakout into user stories. User story framing, as we will explain, helps us design equity and impact into our work from its conception through to the final actions resulting from learning analytics based assessment work. In the third breakout, we'll guide you through thinking about what data sources might respond to the user stories you've identified, whether that data is library centric data or data that might be maintained by other campus sources. And then finally, we'll close the session with some time devoted, devoted to thinking through the end results of the assessment work you've conceptualized throughout our session today and ways to continue the conversation that we start here with your colleagues at your own library and broader institution. Following this roadmap, we hope that by the end of the session, you'll be able to consider questions and problems that may merit a learning analytics approach at your institution, apply a user story format to explicitly articulate potential stakeholders goals and anticipated outcomes and brainstorm potential data sources to address these user stories. Okay, so let's get started with a very brief overview, very brief, hard for me brief um, overview of learning analytics. Again, if you could find you would benefit from more foundational understanding in this area, you can always look back at the previous webinar, as well as the Leland class documents we've shared already today. But to kick off our session now, let's just remind ourselves of a few important points of reference. So, thank you. So let's just briefly uh, review what we mean when we say learning analytics. In some circles, analytics may be used as a stand-in or a newer version of the word assessment. And certainly learning analytics is one type or approach to assessment. But for our context today, we mean learning analytics as it's used broadly in higher education. That is the use of institutional level systems that collect individual level student learning data, centralize it in a record store, and serve as a unified source for research seeking to understand and support student success. Learning analytics at many institutions is conceptualized or actualized as the bringing together of various kinds of data shown in this image on the left in pink ovals into a data repository for the purpose of analysis. The analysis is intended to yield shared understandings about what helps or hinders student success, leading to macro level systemic changes and individual level connections. Leverage shared capacity, such as personnel, skills, and time to increase access to insights and give data back to students and their educational team, shown on the far right, to empower their agency over their own educational journeys and decision making. The dark blue images at the bottom of this depiction represent library data and librarians, though at the current time, very few libraries are contributing data in this way or are on the participating end of the analysis and action resulting from learning analytics initiatives. This status quo omission of libraries from learning analytics has a number of implications, many of which we've covered in several other venues, some of which we can add to chat the presentations. So if you're interested in learning more, we encourage you to view these presentations. So why would anyone want to do all this, right? Um, well, that could be a several days long session in and of itself, Margo, maybe we could do that. Um, but to summarize quite a bit of content into fewer words, learning analytics gives us another unique and powerful tool to discover, diagnose, and predict challenges to learning and learner success and create or deploy active interventions or clear away hurdles entirely to benefit students. Upon hearing this, you might be asking yourself what we mean when we say intervention. That doesn't sound entirely positive, does it? It's not a great word, honestly. So let's talk about what an intervention is and why we'd want to intervene at all. When we intervene, we enact system, systemic and structural changes to practices, policies, and procedures to improve learner experiences and remove obstacles that can impede their success, however they define it. This can mean changing our practices, documentation, and standard operating procedures 
that either inadvertently or perhaps intentionally get in students' ways, make their educational journeys harder, and otherwise cause harm. These interventions or changes can happen on a macro level, clearing paths for many students at once. Interventions can also take place on an individual level. Typically, this looks like facilitating individual level communications and connections. Examples might include providing students with insights into their own learning behaviors, notifying students and their educational support partners of important events or milestones, connecting students with support services, or otherwise connecting students with people, services, and resources that help them, including and, in, and especially information they can glean from access to their own data. Essentially, interventions are actions that any engaged instructor, advisor, or librarian would take if they had the bandwidth and capacity. The fact that many or most instructors, advisors, and librarians have neither the bandwidth nor the, the capacity to connect with individual students in these ways at the scale required by higher education does not justify students having to go without these supports or in learning analytics terms, interventions. So if one assumes that librarians want to fully engage as part of the educational team students can rely upon to facilitate their journeys to success, then it follows that li librarians need to determine ways in which to engage learning analytics as a major assessment approach designed to inform syst systemic improvements and increased individual agency for students. In previous presentations, we shared a number of possible next steps librarians can consider as they determine ways to engage in learning analytics as part of the broader educational ecosystem at their institutions. Today, we're planning to focus on steps five, six, seven, and nine, but not in order. <laughs> we'll start with step six, identifying and analyzing questions or problems meriting a learning analytics approach. Move to step nine, developing key user stories. Take on step seven, envisioning library data contributions to this work, which obviously requires a lot of upfront work in understanding and following your library and institutional privacy policies and procedures, doing the required governance work and engaging in IRB processes. And then close the session with step five, as we begin to think about how to engage the learning analytics conversations at our institutions. Slide. So let's get started with identifying questions to answer and, problem, and or problems to solve, which will bring us to the first breakout of our time together today. At every institution, there are situations, often many of them, that could benefit from more informed decision-making and action-taking. From in institutional leadership, to frontline workers, to the students themselves, everyday individuals make choices, often without sufficient evidence or data to do so in a reasonable, reasoned, logical, empathetic, informed, or beneficial way. Learning analytics offers a new approach to gaining understanding that can augment our existing ways of knowing in unique ways that add to what we can learn from more traditional information gathering and assessment tools. So we're gonna ask you to think a bit about what at your institution or library needs to be better known or understood. What big questions need answering? What important decisions need to be made? Are there problems that need to be solved or what gaps exist between what is known and what needs to be better understood to make decisions and take actions for positive change? In the breakout to come, we're going to ask you to brainstorm some important questions or problems at your institutions that could benefit from additional evidence or data. This will, for most of you, begin with thinking about your institution and the individuals who make up the institution as a whole, rather than beginning with a library centric view. After you consider what big questions or problems are important at your institution, we'll ask you to think about ways that your libraries and your library colleagues could help answer or respond to those issues. Note that this is step two of the process. We'll begin with the overarching institutional issues and then think about ways libraries can connect with those issues. At this stage, we'll ask you to think about the way, ways that the li ways the library does or could contribute to addressing the important issues questions, decisions, or needs facing our institutions and the individuals that comprise our institutions. So what library services, resources, spaces, or areas of expertise are related to these issues? What gaps in understanding might be closed with more or better information? If we had additional information, what might libraries do differently or better to address those important questions, needs, or problems? 
So in this stage, we're going to ask you to move from important issues on your campus to the library's role in contributing to them. I realize that those two steps are already a lot to hold in the forefront of our minds. So let's move to the logistics of the breakout so we can get, get started in having you record some of your ideas. So today's workshop is structured around three breakout sessions during which you'll be working in pre-assigned small groups. Each breakout has its own group worksheet with a companion document that contains the instructions. We'll share a document via chat in just a moment that contains your group assignments along with a link to your group's worksheet. You'll see on the instruction sheet, which is linked in the group worksheet, that each breakout outlines key tasks, which include content to consider and helpful resources. Each breakout will be begin with five minutes of individual time for thinking and making notes in your group worksheet, and then five minutes of group time to discuss your thoughts with your group mates. Each breakout builds upon the last, so do try to move through all the stages of each breakout so that you'll be ready for the next breakout when it comes. So, for example, in our first breakout, this is what the key task section looks like, as outlined in the breakout room instructions document that you'll have access to. Each, uh, rather, the key task for each breakout session is at the top. In this case, identify questions or problems in your library or on your campus that might merit a learning analytics approach. The activity then prompts you to consider first those issues and concerns at the institutional level, and then ways libraries might contribute beneficially to those issues and concerns. On the right are helpful resources that might get you started. It will likely be helpful for you to keep the instructions page open on your computer if you can, as you'll return to it throughout the workshop. Okay, then once in your breakout you've reviewed the key tasks, you'll proceed to your group worksheet and find your name. You'll see that each person has their own individual workspace in the larger group worksheet. Each set of tables in your workspace corresponds to the instructions outlined in the breakout instructions document. The first step prompts you to brainstorm a number of institutional issues or concerns and then complete the ideation process for each one. We've left space for you to think through more than one idea and you should feel free to add rows as needed. After about five minutes, you'll receive, you'll receive a Zoom broadcast message coaching you to move on to step two in the instruction document, in which we offer a prompt to help guide the group discussion that you'll undertake in the second half of each breakout. At this point, you may be wondering what group you're in. <laughs> um, so we've assigned you to small groups based on your preference, as indicated in the survey we sent last Friday. For those of you who didn't have a chance to complete the survey, we went ahead and assigned you to a group. Becky and Ken are sharing a link to a document in chat that's organized by last name. There it is, like magic. It includes, it includes your group number and also a link to the group worksheet, to your group worksheet. So please go ahead and open up that document now. Find your name. Take note of your group number, maybe write it down. And then click to open your group worksheet. When the breakout rooms open in just a minute, you'll need to join that assigned group, so the same number group. We'll give you a moment or two to find your name on the group assignment sheet, and then we'll open the breakouts and off you'll go. Remember, we'll spend about 10 minutes in this first breakout, first with five minutes of individual work, and then with five minutes of sharing in your small group. We'll send, group, we'll send breakout messages um, to the rooms during this time to keep you on track. What if you don't find your name on the Google list? then we will help you. <laughs> we will help you. Like the no, no amount of preparing can like thwart all problems. So we, we will help you as you go. So I think. And, and just to um, answer that Lori's question there in the chat, all of the group worksheets have space for additional folks to, to join. Yep, absolutely. There's definitely extra space. Okay, so I'm thinking that you've got a minute or so here to find your number. Um, and then also these are the same group numbers that I sent you an email um, first thing this morning, except if you were a late, um, if you were a, a very late um, registrant. Which is fine to be. Sure. And then you'll be, <laughs> and then you'll be staying in these groups um, for all the breakouts. So once you're in one, that will be your room to return to. So um, do we have the breakout rooms ready to launch? Yes, I can go ahead and open them if you're ready. 
I think we are. Ken, Becky, this you is, good? This is the fingers crossed mm -hmm. part of Zoom that it all works okay, but I'll yep. open the room. <laughs> So for me, I got a little little tiny pop up that said join a breakout room and then I can find the group on the very long list. There was lots of registrants for today. And I see folks are are quickly finding their rooms. And if, the, if any of you are having trouble, we can we can help you find a room or assign you to a room if you can't find your name on the list. I, I found my list, but I did not get a pop up. Okay, if you go down to the ribbon at the bottom, or I, well, it's at the bottom for me, but I know it isn't for everybody on Zoom, there should be like a little four square window. If you click on breakout yeah. room, sometimes that will launch it. Hmm. Otherwise, the folks that are, um, I probably, Margo, can you, if, um, Who's speaking? Is that um... Andrea Stanfield? Sorry. Oh, Andrea. Sorry, <laughs> that's okay. Um, uh, if you can give the number, then I bet Margo. Oh wait, I just see it. I see okay. it now. Okay. Thank okay. you. Sorry. Great. Excellent. Good job. Good morning or good afternoon. This is Nola. I, with Vision, I'm, I'm a little bit slow with reading the, the spreadsheet. So I'm just trying to find what my group would be. Um, so one second, I can help you, Nola. Yeah. Um, you're in group 25. Okay. And I don't, so that should be way at the bottom of the list. Okay. And I don't see uh, the square that you mentioned, Megan, I'm looking um, for options to find the room. Okay. Um, we should be able to move you. Um, Becky and Marco. Oh yeah. I can, close, right? I'll, I can, I'll move. I I'll move Nola. Anything. Okay. Yeah, and then and we might want to. It looks like time to graduation. There's just Thank one you. in those rooms. We might want to can collapse. We can collapse. Yeah, like put rooms. Mark and La Monica. Like put Nola, Mark, and Monica in twenty three. Oh gosh, I just put forty seconds. Welcome back, everybody who's coming back in. We've got about a half a minute before everyone gets kicked out of their group. So this is just a moment to breathe, to recuperate from being bumped from one group to another, or what have you. About 20 seconds left. About six seconds left, but who's counting? All right. Watching the numbers. Here comes everybody back. Okay. Excellent. The first breakout is always the hardest. <laughs> so thank you all for your patience and cooperation. We, um, we, I don't know if this makes you feel better, but um, we have put a lot of time and energy in trying to get the groups right. And then of course, not everybody can come to a webinar and several people responded they were looking for, forward to the recording. So we had to move some of you. And I know that was probably a little disorienting, right? Like in a physical space, we wouldn't like plop you into another table without any kind of <laughs> warning, but here we are in Zoom, we do that. So thank you for um, getting uh, into the group that you were in, trying to make progress. Now that you're in that group, you might wanna make a note of it, um, although the system should keep it. Um, so we're gonna put you back in the same groups repeatedly. So now that we have groups set, we should be good to go. Right, I know Nola, right? Like we all, what we could do with more time. I just, that's true for now and true always. All right, so I wanna hand, I wanna, um, just express my appreciation for your willingness to get into those groups and do that hard work. And um, we were sort of looking, jumping from group breakout to group breakout worksheet to just sort of look at how you're doing and it was really exciting stuff starting to emerge. So at this point, I wanna turn you over to Ken for the next section of content and breakout. Hi, and welcome back. Um, so we're going to turn now to a model that we'll use in the next breakout session to continue the brainstorming process. Just now you've identified some problems you would like to tackle using data. And these are probably framed, and many of them that I looked at were framed as big questions, even if you take into account the library angle on a larger campus or institutional issue. So 
what we're going to do now is an exercise to turn your problem statements and rephrase them as user stories. The concept of a user story comes out of agile software development, but it's really helpful for, for non-developers. So a user story has three parts to it. It's a description of a person or actor, a description of a goal, and a description of the outcome or reason for that goal. For example, as a who, I mean, very simple example here, as a who, I want what, so that why. Um, so uh, as a stakeholder, I want to be able to do an activity or to have an awareness or to take an action in order to perhaps achieve some outcome, solve some specific problem or meet some need. In so and this slide shows a few more uh, detailed examples um, that, are, that come from the LILA, the Library Integration Additional Learning Analytics Project, where one of the outcomes of that, uh, of that uh, grant was a prioritized list of user stories. Um, and these are taken right out of the LILA report along with many, many, many more. So we'll just walk through them. So as a librarian, I want to know whether the amount of student library resource use impacts transfer, transfer student retention so that I can encourage faculty to require use of more library resources in their teaching content and assignment design and encourage transfer students to increase their library resource use. These are not Hemingway sentences, but they're designed to encapsulate the problem and give you a direction as to how to solve it or what you need to do to solve it. A more concise example, as a librarian, I want to know whether the relationship between the use of library services and institutional outcomes varies by student status so that I can tailor library services to meet these specialized needs. So in both these examples, the problem has been pair of, or rephrased in the blue, um, the, the, the goal, and then you have the outcome, which is why you're doing that, asking that question in the first place. So um, as you build your user stories, you want to think broadly about the person category. These can be broad or narrow as necessary. You might have individuals or groups such as faculty, librarians, academic advisors, institutional researchers, institutional leaders. Your story may not be about a library at, library person asking the question, but it helps you frame the campus question in a way the library might be able to contribute to. So if you want some thought starters, uh, uh, you could uh, take a look at the list of user stories that were generated as part of the Leela uh, exercise, which is going to be in chat in a second. So there are dozens of stories there that could serve as a model for you. So now we're going to turn to your second breakout and you'll go back to the same place that you were with the same people. We hope that everything goes smoothly. Um, of course, come back and ask us if you have questions. Um, as in the first, first session, we'll break into two five minute parts. For the first five minutes, you'll individually brainstorm at least one user story based on the key task you came up with in the first breakout room, break, breakout session. If your key task could be approached from multiple perspectives, feel free to generate more user stories than just the one. Um, but please do try to come up with at least one. Um, then after about five minutes, and we'll give you a prompt, within your small group, talk about the stories you came up with. And we'll share a couple of questions with you when it's time to shift focus. All right, so now, uh, it is time to go back into the breakout and rejoin your previous rooms. Yes, we will give you a timed reminder, Nola. Thanks for asking. Yes. All right, as people are coming back in from the breakout rooms, we'll take just a minute to give everybody a chance to make the long walk down the hallway. All right, the rooms should be closed. Yep, and everybody seems to be filing in. So, well, good, thank you. Uh, thank you for your, your contributions there. I've been 
looking through some of the group worksheets and just had a, a couple of, of user stories that uh, I wanted to just, just note as I think being, being particularly interesting. Um, in group 17, there's, there's a story about uh, as a librarian, I want to collaborate with other student success groups so that the library can be a key player in impacting student success. So that's a nice user story that kind of takes the library out of its often traditional roles and could lead to some discovering and activating some interesting collaborations. Um, another yeah. one uh, I'll, I'll cherry pick out of group nine. Um, as a librarian, I want to know if students who utilize the library have more fulfilling immersion experiences so that we can mark the library as a key component of the university's immersion program. And that's something that I, I'm curious about personally, because I, I don't know what that program is at that particular university, but that's a nice way to, to open doors and investigation into finding those connections. So that, that will make a nice segue into our third breakout room in a minute. Do uh, Megan or Becky, do either of you have any you'd like to highlight? Yeah, I do. <clears throat> Excuse me. So a couple of these, hold on one second. <laughs> apologies, um, are a little bit closer to home in terms of um, library work, but also set up great for the for the kind of work that learning analytics can do. So I'm going to pull a couple. Um, I'm in group one. So as a librarian, I want to know if the information literacy lessons sessions rather help students to produce better research papers so that I can use that information to encourage other professors who do not schedule information literacy sessions. And that that strikes me as something we've wanted to know for a long time, but getting access to research papers is really hard. Um, but if we have, um, you know, if we can uh, partner library data with data from learning management systems that might reflect how well students are doing um, in the judgment of their faculty or you know also possibly getting some access to that um that is something that we could do because what learning management system data does record grades and things like that and possibly even a rubric detailed data you all know how i like rubrics and another one is um from the same group as a library or librarian i want to know more about student populations we are not reaching so that we can work towards learning more about what reference and instructional services we can provide and how to deliver these services. So that's really great as well. Um, marrying the the uh, use of the library with looking at different types of student populations and seeing who who the library isn't reaching. So that works really well as well. So thanks. Good job all. Yes, yes. Indeed. yeah, I'm, I'm impressed. Um, so I'll turn it over to Becky now to lead us into the third piece of the workshop. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for um, thinking through those user stories. And, and many of those relate very closely to home to the work I do in, in, in my own library, um, especially that last one about who we're not reaching and how might we reach them or create convincing arguments to our faculty across campus to help us reach those folks. So really, really great um, thought starters there. So now that you've transformed the big questions that you started with into some user stories, let's think about what types of data you'll need to actually address those stories that you've identified, whether that data is library centric data or is data that might be maintained by other campus sources. Quite often, it's going to be a blend of both. As you're thinking about the sorts of data you'll need, you'll also need to think about the preparation that needs to come before you collect or gather the data, things like establishing uh, your library's privacy policy or identifying a policy, understanding your campus data handling and data governance guidelines, things like who, um, how data can be shared and to what level of specificity that data can be passed around from unit to unit, et cetera. Uh, you'll also want to be um, seeking IRB approval if, um, if that applies to your project and making connections with campus colleagues who may provide some of the data that you might need to answer your questions. And then once you have all of the data in place, then, or all of the pre-work in place, then you can think about the actual data. So doing this type of work, this learning analytics work, typically requires a unique person identifier that you can use then to tie or align all of your data together, something like a student ID or a username or an email, something that's special for each individual that then um, all of your data sets 
have that same kind of identifier. You'll also want to look for data that demonstrates user engagement with the library, such as maybe participation in the library instruction session or use of uh, different types of library resources or services or spaces. And then you'll want to also be thinking about some kind of outcome measure. For example, in the library analytics work we do in, in our organization, we've been looking at Mac macro big picture outcomes, things like year one to year two retention or four year cumulative GPA and six year graduation rates or time to graduation. And you can certainly also look at more micro level things like assignment grades or course grades. Um, there, there's so many different different possibilities. And then you may also find it helps to give meaning or context to your data if you have a bit of information about the students themselves. Uh, perhaps things like you're in school, major or program that they're enrolled in. Um, even in maybe, maybe you're interested if they're first generation students or if they're from an underserved um, community. Um, some, but you know, be thoughtful about what kinds of data that you you think will help lend understanding to um, uh, finding solutions. And then finally, when you're creating your data structures and aligning your data, you'll likely find it helpful to be um, to include some kind of date time references so that you can look at engagements at specific um, points of time or outcomes at specific points of time. Things, <clears throat> excuse me, like an academic year or a semester or a duration of an assignment period. So on this slide, I've shared some ideas of some different types of data sources. This is not uh, an all-inclusive list. This is just, these are just things that I commonly find myself going to. Um, for library data, you might consider uh, things like facilities usage. For example, if you have library study rooms as um, students reserve, then you may have reservation data. Um, some, some libraries collect um, like have students tap or tap their ID card when they enter the building. So then you would have a record of, of the engagement or a person using or at least entering a physical space. Um, you might um, want to consider use of resources. This could be like a number of checkouts of books or a number of checkouts of something or, um, or checkouts of course reserves, things like that. And then another um, point that, or another data point that may be of interest is interactions with librarians. Things like, did a student participate in a instruction, information literacy instruction session with a librarian or um, library employee? Or did they, did a student participate in a reference consultation with a library librarian? And then possibly, um, perhaps you're collecting attendance information if students are attending events, not not just classes, but you know, kind of more of the culturally enriching events. Your Office of Institutional Research research, you know, I recommend partnering them with them from the very beginning where you're starting to hatch your ideas. Uh, they're the folks who are going to uh, most typically be able to provide you with the demo demographic information about your students and the information related to the outcome measures, particularly if they're the big picture macro outcomes like retention or graduation. If you're working on a more micro level, you may want to collaborate with faculty to include course or assignment grades, information about assignments, instructional information such as what content was taught or even the methods used to teach the content. And then finally, for a more holistic picture of student engagement, you might want to consider including um, engagement data with extracurricular and other curricular partners on your campus that might come from places like your student affairs office. Uh, and they, they often collect data related to if students are part of Greek life organizations or clubs or the co-curricular, when I'm speaking about co-curricular, other, other um, entities on campus whose support students' academic success, things like the Writing Center or the um, Tutoring Center on our campus is called the um, 
University Center for Academic Excellence. They're the folks who do tutoring, supplemental instruction. So um, groups like that. So on this slide, you can see how a user story and the identified data sources then fit together. So in this user story, a librarian wants to know whether the amount of library resource usage impacts transfer student retention so that they can encourage faculty to use more library resources in their teaching content and also encourage transfer students to increase their library resource use. This may look familiar. This is one of the examples on your worksheets. Um, and then data to respond to this story may include a student's use of library resources that you might measure with um, like number of checkouts of books or authentications to um, Easy Proxy or Open Athens that students need to go through those authentications to get to the um, uh, fee-based content, um, databases, journals, et cetera, or the number of checkouts of course reserves. And then to answer this question, I'd also be looking for some information from the Office of Institutional Research. I might be interested in their admission status, particularly since I'm, I'm thinking about transfer students. I want to be able to, to um, tag students who are transfer students versus those who may be in first time in college freshmen. And then I'm going to want to know um, if they came back for a second year of study, that retention piece. So now here we are getting ready for breakout session number three. Um, and Ken or Megan will be um, putting into the chat the class grant that we talked about early on. Um, that In that um, grant project and, and the corresponding book or, or resource materials, there's a, a listing of wonderful, um, a wonderful list of possible data sources you might consider many of those things I mentioned on the previous slides but then but then the tables in in these resources have more so those could help you um, get started thinking about what make might make sense for your stories so let's go ahead and move you back into your breakouts and begin working in your um, uh, independent or in your sections of the worksheets um, so this should match exactly what you have in your worksheet. And I think we're ready to get started. Thanks, Becky. Looks like we've got our rooms open. All right. I'll give people just a minute to reconvene here. Looks good. All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. I hope you found that a useful exercise. And though we don't have time today to talk about how to analyze the data, this is a really important step is just sketching out the what data you'll need. And and at my desk, I would then sketch out how am I going to analyze that. But again, that would be something maybe for a future workshop. Um, but I, I was just talking with Megan and Ken while you were in your breakout rooms that there's a lot of times that I assemble my data set, uh, you know, align all of my data together and do my analysis and then realize maybe there's more data that I really need to answer my my questions or or you know get a better picture. Of, of what I'm trying to figure out. For example, at our library, we um, were very interested in, in understanding how the student engagements with the actual librarian um, can inf impact their, their um, retention, their student success, whatever we're gonna call those outcomes. And so we had data related to students participating in participation and instruction, but our, our reference and instruction librarian said, you know, what's really a very high impact thing that happens are the one-on-one um, -on -one or one-on-two reference consultations, um, where, you know, it's kind of a form of instruction. It's just very in-depth and personalized, and that really matters a lot to us, but we didn't have data 
in, in a way that could be shared or, you know, that could be tied with the actual students. So with that understanding, then we created a process in our library to then begin collecting that data moving forward, you know, so that we could have, have information about, you know, which students participate in instruction. So then we can also determine which ones don't. Um, so again, we had to create new new structures to capture new data to help us understand those, um, how to address our problems or, or um, fulfill our stories. I'm gonna pause there and turn it over to Megan to um, lead, us, lead us home. And by the way, that was your last full breakout session. So maybe you'll breathe a sigh of relief or I'm not sure, but um, thanks all for persist, participating that way. Thank you, yes, thanks Becky. So at this point in our 90 minutes together, you've considered important issues and questions at your institutions um, that could benefit from additional information. You've crafted user stories and you've reflected on what data might be used to respond to those user stories and contribute to addressing issues on your campuses and at your libraries. So what are some good next steps? There are really two things to think about next, and we've built these steps into your worksheets that we don't have sufficient time to address them in breakouts today. So first, it's important to sort of check your work and think through the implications of your plans as they're conceived currently. For each of your user stories, consider that last section, the purpose, reason, or outcome you hope to address in doing this work, your why. When you follow through on the work you envision today, what concrete, concrete steps will you take towards your purpose, outcome, or reason? Thinking through those next steps is part one of what you might do next. The second part of what you could do next is getting started moving in the direction that you've outlined for yourself today. This is also included as an action plan template in your worksheet. You've got great ideas drafted, but what would you need to do next to make it a reality? What questions do you still have? What resources do you need? Who would you need to include? And what is a reasonable timeline for making some progress? We encourage you to continue through these steps so that you have so that you can actualize the great work that you've been thinking about and doing uh, and writing about here today. And in the spirit of committing to action, we're about to ask you to share to share some of your ideas with us in chat. So as we all consider our next steps, we'd like you to take a moment to share with us something you've learned today that you hope to put into action. So if you could. Please think about what you could take from our time together and with your group mates and act upon and then put that idea in the chat. We'd love to see your thoughts and perhaps you might find others that are planning to take similar actions as you and so you could make connections that will sustain you in this work going forward. So i'll pause and let you type so i'm typing no one if i'm talking no one's typing so we're looking for and something you learned today that you hope to put into action. What data sources I can explore to work towards answering my question? Yes. Uh, go back and find out what each department is collecting. Oh, a data audit. I think Holt is on this call. Data audits are like Holt and my favorite things. Um, there's a lot going on. Got to get the big picture. Using, oh, here they all come. Using user stories. I think it's a really great tool too. It makes a big difference to me because the why is always there, not just the what. Um, interrogating the data, what can we actually learn from what we're keeping, a roadmap for units looking at their own questions, that's great. Uh, analytics, oh, the dashboard, good. I know, right? Like hearing from Becky, it's like worth the, worth the, the, the visit, so that's great. Here's some more examples of how it's been put into action. This is, un this is unbelievable, good. User stories. Going back to peers, finding, good, this is great. Okay, they're all coming through. 17 new messages, that's exciting. We're gonna save that, somebody save it. Um, okay, so as you share these, as I'm scanning down, I'm seeing that a number of you um, are, are alluding to continuing the conversation with your colleagues, both at your libraries and your institutions, and that's great. So let's talk about a few things to keep in mind as you continue this conversation at your at your home campus. Can you have a, 
advance. Thank you. So first, I think it's important to note that while some of you may have been working in this space for some time, for many, this is new territory. Working in learning analytics efforts at our institutions may not be typical roles for many librarians. But having said that, our skills and values are relevant in this work, and our data is super important to include in the overall campus picture of student learning and experience. For example, many of us have experience with this is on the next slide too. Um, one more slide so that you have a visual too. There, thanks. So many of us have experience with supporting teaching and learning, analyzing and visualizing data, and leading and collaborating on campus. So it would also be wonderful to hear how you've contributed your, knowledges and, your knowledge and abilities as librarians to learning analytics work at your institution, or if you haven't yet, how you imagine yourself doing so in the future. So second round of, of chat responses. If you could please share in chat what roles related to learning analytics you feel co confident contributing to. And some of the ideas are here on the slide and that I just mentioned. So, you know, following up on what we learn from the results to support students or helping with data analysis and visualization or collaborating with others on campus. I'd love to hear what, what skills you all already have that you recognize will be valuable in this conversation. Just give it a moment of thought and type in your response. Yeah, close and campus wide relationships, right? To being able to leverage those collaboration. Oh, a faculty Senate president. <laughs> That's excellent. Well done. Campus collaboration, collecting data. Uh, online learning objects that the library created. Great. Oh, I see a causation correlation conversation going on. Yeah, well. that was me. I was okay. responding to an earlier thread. Oh, yeah. No, that's, that's yep. a great conversation. And, 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 and just in case the folks didn't didn't see it, in, in social science research, which is where library work is, um, causational research isn't, isn't, doesn't take place in social sciences research. That causation stuff is kind of reserved for the hired sciences. Um, things like physics, chemistry, things like where you can actually at least almost prove something. And in, in library research, educational research, it usually relies on underlying correlations, whether you're looking at um, analysis of variance, which are group differences or regressions, like how things contribute to um, to a, a factor, odds, things like that. So. Yeah, correlations is where and, educators live, right? Uh -huh. Like, and then you probe deeper. Yeah. And just and you, as long as you know what you're dealing with is a correlation, and you don't try to mentally go to causation, you stay mm -hmm. in that space, stay in the correlation space. I've written about that a couple times. But, too. but even in, sorry, even if you have a, a mere correlation with something that's new that to you on campus, it's probably new to your colleagues on the on the other side of the library campus. Uh, split and it opens conversations and opens partnerships by you can say mm -hmm. isn't this interesting why is this and then you can do the in-depth research and conversations with the student body in fact uh, impacted or others to figure out what's going on so the research can actually can, can be a you know a, a way to open a door that was previously shut or maybe that you didn't even realize was there um and not just an answer in itself and then one more thing i, I get on my soapbox that that this kind of work Often you will you will want to supplement it with other other types of data data sources, qualitative things like interviews, focus groups, observations. Right. So the learning this what we're calling learning analytics is not typically the end all to decision making. You, I really recommend triangulating with the, the the those qualitative pieces that are so rich and important. Yeah, it's like a scan, and then you need to probe deeper. Yeah. Right? Okay. So, okay, so I'm on the next slide, and I know we're getting close to time, but I'm going to, I'm going to soldier on. Um, so I, it, did, it did sound like a lot of you were talking about collaboration and into advocacy. So if you're feeling inspired to advocate for this work, and it seems like some of you do, there are opportunities to do so both in your library and on your campus. So for example, you can share what you learned today and elsewhere with your library colleagues and strategize about how to move from plans to findings to concrete actions that make things better for students and empower their educational journeys. 
On campus, you can present your findings, contextualizing your results in terms of value to student learning and other important campus issues and goals. And perhaps most importantly, you can engage in the planning of this work and not as an afterthought. In this way, since learning analytics is coming, you can be ready. So we want to all thank you for your participation in our workshop today. We know these are tough ideas, big ideas that present both new challenges and exciting opportunities. And we know that it's hard work getting engaged with such new territory in many libraries and institutions. So you have uh, all our gratitude for being such excellent participants and partners in our session. So at this point, I know it's tight, but um, I, I'm gonna turn it over to Ken in case he was able to glean any questions for Q&A. So we did have a couple of questions, um, which we can attempt to get to. Uh, so the first uh, was, how can we avoid jumping from data correlations to causation, especially if it conveniently supports an argument we would like to make? <laughs> E.g., just because the transfer students have lower retention rates and they check out fewer library materials doesn't mean checking out more library materials will improve their retention rates. And that is an excellent point. I mean, Correlation and causation are in two different universes, and we rarely want to cross, cross that. But it does let you open up the door, as I was mentioning earlier, to other conversations and other avenues of inquiry to find out what that correlation actually might mean. Um, why is that the case? Are, and does it, in fact, matter? Is it the, you know, uh, to ask the instructors or to work with instructors of transfer students or the transfer students themselves to try to understand what, what could be done? And maybe the answer is in the library, and maybe it's not. But without asking the question, you can't get started. Do you want to add anything, either of you? I'm worried about Megan the time. <laughs> I think yeah, you said it so beautifully, Ken. Um, and we are so. at the top of the hour. But you know, we all um, we all welcome continued conversations. Becky, Ken, and I, uh -huh. I'm absolutely speaking for them, but I feel confident in doing so, that continuing this conversation um, in, into the future is absolutely something we'd, all, we'd love to do with all of you. As you, if you get, if you are moving through this work and get stuck or have questions, you know, it's uh -huh. a community. So we all want to be able to help each other. Absolutely. I love I love chatting with others about it. So yeah, so um, yeah. Becky, yeah. The, the, asking about the the work maintaining access to their worksheets. Do you want to speak to that? Oh, yeah. Um, um, you'll still be able to access your worksheet. I'll, I'll send out that same um, group doc that has everybody's name and and um, your worksheet assignments. So the worksheets will stay open. And and then for those who couldn't come, well, for all of you, you'll receive a copy of the recording and the slides and then a generic worksheet, but you'll still be able to ac access the one you worked on um, by going through that group assignment document that I'll share out um, via email. And thank you, we are over time, but thanks for hanging in with us. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Thanks all. Thanks.